Skills, Module 8, Bowel Elimination, Chapter 47. I would like to remind you to please review the objectives at the beginning of the chapter as well as be familiar with the key terms in blue. Regular elimination of bowel waste products is essential for normal body functioning. Alterations in bowel elimination are often the early signs or symptoms of problems within either the GI, gastrointestinal, or other body sy systems. Because bowel function depends on the balance of several factors, elimination patterns and habits vary among individuals. Understanding normal bowel elimination and the factors that promote, impede, or cause alterations in elimination helps the nurse to manage the patient's elimination problems. Supportive nursing care respects the patient's privacy and their emotional needs. Measures designed to promote normal elimination also need to minimize discomfort and embarrassment for the patient. We'll take a minute to review the scientific knowledge base and the anatomy and physiology of the GI system. Please be reminded that this, if this information is unfamiliar to review your AMP. The GI tract is a series of hollow mucous membrane lined muscular organs. These organs absorb fluid and nutrients, prepare food for absorption and use by body cells, and provide for temporary storage of feces. The GI tract absorbs high volumes of fluid, making fluid and electrolyte balance a key function of the GI system. In addition to ingested fluids, fluids and foods, the GI tract also receives secretions from the gallbladder and the pancreas. The mouth. Its function is to mechanically and chemically break down nutrients into usable size and form. As food enters the upper esophagus, it passes through the upper esophageal sphincter. The bolus of food travels down the esophagus with the aid of peristalsis, which is a contraction that propels food through the length of the GI tract. The food moves down the esophagus and reaches the cardiac sphincter, which lies between the esophagus and the upper end of the stomach. The sphincter prevents influx the sphincter prevents reflux of stomach contents back into the esophagus. The stomach performs three tasks: the storage of the swallowed food in liquid, the mixing of food with digestive enzymes to form a substance called chyme, and the regulated emptying of its contents into the small intestine. Movement within the small intestine occurring by peristalsis facilitates both digestion and absorption. Chyme comes into the small intestine as a liquid material and mixes with digestive enzymes. Resorption in the small intestine is so efficient that by the time the fluid reaches the end of the small intestine, it is a thick liquid with, semi, with semi-solid particles in consistency. The small intestine is divided into three sections, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. The large intestine is divided into the cecum, the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and the rectum. The large intestine is the primary organ of bowel elimination. The colon has three functions, to absorb, secrete, and then eliminate. Again, the colon has three functions, to absorb, secrete, and eliminate. Peristaltic contractions move contents through the colon. Mass peristalsis pushes undigested food toward the rectum. This mass movement occurs over only three or four times daily with the strongest during the hour directly after mealtime. The rectum contains vertical and transverse folds of tissue that help to control expulsion of fecal contents during defecation. Each fold contains veins that can become distended from pressure during straining. This distension results in what is called hemorrhoids. The body expels feces and flatus from the rectum through the anus. Normal defecation begins with the movement in the left colon, moving toward the anus. When stool reaches the rectum, the distension causes relaxation of the internal sphincter and an awareness of the need to defecate. At the time of defecation, the external sphincter relaxes and abdominal muscles contract, increasing intrarectal pressure and forcing the stool out. Normally, defecation is painless, resulting in the passage of soft, formed stool. 
Straining while having a bowel movement indicates that the patient may need changes in their diet or fluid intake and that there is an underlying disorder or there could be an underlying disorder in GI function. Factors affecting bowel elimination. Many factors influence the process of eliminating the bowel. Knowledge of these factors will help increase our knowledge and, be, and help us to be able to anticipate measures required to maintain normal elimination patterns. Age. Fluid intake, psychological factors, positioning during defecation, pregnancy, medications, diet, physical activity, personal habits, pain, surgery, and anesthesia as well as diagnostic tests can affect defecation. I would like to point out that we're focusing mainly on the over adult but keep in mind that depending upon developmental age it will affect bowel elimination for example infants have a smaller stomach capacity and less secretion of digestive enzymes which makes a rapid intestinal peristalsis therefore the ability to control defecation does not occur until two to three years of age adolescents experience rapid growth and increased metabolic rates there is also rapid growth of the large intestine and increased secretion of gastric acids to digest food fibers and act as a bactericide against swallowed organisms. Older adults may have decreased chewing ability. Peristalsis declines and esophageal emptying will slow. This impairs absorption by the intestinal mucosa. Muscle tone in the perineal floor and anal sphincter weakens and may cause difficulty in controlling defecation. Regular food intake helps to maintain a regular pattern of peristalsis in the colon. Fiber in the diet provides bulk in the fecal material, thus making defecation easier. Bulk forming foods help remove the fats and waste products from the body. Some bulk forming foods or high fiber foods will cause or produce gas which will distend the intestinal walls and increase, and increase colonic activity or motility. While individual needs vary with each person, a fluid intake of 3 liters per minute for men, 3 liters per day, excuse me, for men, and 2.2 liters per day for women is recommended. Fluid intake of 3 liters per day for men and 2.2 liters per day for women is recommended. Fluid helps to liquefy intestinal contents by absorbing into the fiber from the diet, creating a large, soft stool mass. Physical activity also promotes peristalsis. Prolonged emotional distress will decrease the function or decrease peristalsis. Personal elimination habits also influence bowel functioning. If you have a busy schedule, sometimes it prevents individuals from responding appropriately to the urge to defecate. Therefore, this disruption in regular habits can cause alterations such as constipation. Because squatting is the normal position during defecation, many immobilized patients that are confined to bed will have problems with defecation. If this condition permits, you want to raise the head of the bed to assist the patient to a more normal sitting position on a bedpan. This will enhance the ability to defecate. Other conditions such as hemorrhoids, rectal surgery, anal fissures, and abdominal surgery which results in discomfort can have an effect on elimination of the bowel. As pregnancy advances, the size of the fetus increases and pressure is exerted on the rectum. A temporary obstruction created by the fetus can also impair passage of feces. Slowing of peristalsis during the third trimester often leads to constipation in the pregnant woman. Additionally, if the pregnant woman has frequent straining during defecation or delivery, hemorrhoids may form. General anesthetic agents used during, used during surgery often cause temporary cessation of peristalsis. The patient who receives a local or regional anesthetic is less at risk for elimination alterations because this type of anesthesia gen generally affects bowel activity only a small amount. Any surgery that involves direct manipulation of the bowel will temporarily stop peristalsis as well and this condition is known as an ileus. Ileus or ili usually lasts about 24 to 48 hours. If the patient remains inactive or is unable to eat after surgery, the return of normal bowel elimination is further delayed. Many medications also 
have secondary effects on the patient's bowel elimination patterns. Diagnostic exams inv that involve visualization of the GI tract or GI structures can often require a prescribed bowel prep to include laxatives and or enemas to ensure that the bowel is empty. Usually the patient cannot eat or drink several hours before examination such as colonoscopies, endoscopies, or other tests that require visualization of the GI tract. We will review some common bowel elimination problems. Constipation, impaction, diarrhea, incontinence, flatulence, and hemorrhoids. Constipation is a symptom, not a disease. Constipation is a symptom, not a disease. It is called it causes infrequent stools that are hard and dry as well as small. Impaction this is a result from unrelieved constipation, which is a collection of hardened feces wedged in the rectum that the person cannot expel. Diarrhea. This is an increase in the number of stools and the passage of liquid unformed feces. Incontinence. This is the inability to control the passage of feces and gas to the anus. Flatulence. This is the accumulation of gas in the intestines which causes the walls to stretch. Hemorrhoids. Dilated engorged veins in the lining of the rectum. Please take a moment to review the common bowel elimination problems. Okay. Certain diseases or surgical alterations make the normal passage of intestinal contents throughout the small and large intestine difficult or inadvisable. When these conditions are present, a temporary or permanent opening is surgically created by bringing a portion of the intestine through the abdominal wall, and this is called a stoma. S-T-O-M-A. These surgical openings are called an ileostomy or a colostomy, depending on which part of the intestinal tract is used to create the stoma. Newer surgical techniques allow more patients to have portions of their small and large intestine removed and the remaining portions to be reconnected so that they will continue to have defecation through the anal canal. If you take a look at the photos on figure 47.2 and 47.3 of the sigmoid colostomy and the ileostomy. Bowel diversions continued. The location of an ostomy is going to determine the stool consistency. A person with a sigmoid colostomy will have a more formed, formed stool. The output from a transverse colostomy will be thick liquid to soft consistency. These ostomies are the easiest to perform surgically and are done as temporary means to divert stool from an area of trauma or a perianal wound. There may also be a palliative diversion if obstruction from a tumor is present. With an ileostomy, the fecal effluent leaves the body before it enters the colon, creating frequent liquid stools. With the ileostomy, the fecal effluent leaves the body before it enters the colon, creating frequent liquid stools. Then you have the loop colostomy. These are reversible stomas that may be constructed in the ileum or the colon. The surgeon pulls a loop of intestine onto the abdomen and may place a plastic rod, bridge, or rubber catheter temporarily under the bowel to keep it from slipping back. The surgeon then opens the bowel and sutures it to the skin of the abdomen. The loop ostomy has two openings through the stoma. The proximal end drains fecal effluent and the distal portion drains mucus. The end colostomy consists of a stoma formed by bridging a piece of the intestine out through a surgically created opening in the abdominal wall. The intestine distal to, distal to the the intestine distal to the stoma is either removed or sewn closed and left in the abdominal cavity. End colostomies may be permanent or reversible. With the end colostomy, the rectum may be left intact or it can be removed. Other approaches. The ileoanal pouch anastomosis is a surgical procedure that is used in patients who have had 
to have a colectomy for treatment of ulcerative colitis or other femoral diseases. In this procedure, the surgeon removes the colon, creates a pouch from the end of the small intestine, and attaches the pouch to the patient's anus. This pouch provides for the collection of fecal material which simulates the function of the rectum, the ileoanal pouch. This pouch provides for the collection of fecal material which simulates the function of the rectum as it attaches to the patient's anus. The patient is, con is continent of stool because stool is evacuated via the anus. When the ileal pouch is created, the patient has a temporary ileostomy to divert the fecal stream or effluent and allow the suture lines in the pouch to heal. A continent ileostomy involves creating a pouch from the small intestine. This procedure is one that is rarely done, but there are still patients who have had the procedures done in the past. The patient has a continent stoma on the abdomen created with a valve that can be drained only when the patient places a large catheter into the stoma. The patient empties this type pouch several times a day. Then you have an integrate continence enema. Integrate continence enema. This is a procedure that is usually done in children with fecal soiling associated with neuropathic or structural abnormalities of the anal sphincter. A continence valve with an opening on the abdomen is surgically created in the intestine so that the patient or caregiver can insert a tube and give themselves an enema with, which comes out through the anus. Colonic evacuation will generally begin about 10 to 20 minutes after the patient receives the enema fluid. Critical thinking. Again, successful critical thinking requires a synthesis of knowledge, experience, information gathered from patients, critical thinking attitudes, and intellectual and professional standards. Clinical judgments require you to anticipate the information necessary, analyze the data, and make decisions regarding patient care. In the case of bowel elimination, integrate the knowledge from nursing and other disciplines to understand the patient's response to bowel elimination alterations. Experience in caring for patients with elimination alterations helps you provide an appropriate plan of care. You want to utilize critical thinking attitudes such as fairness, confidence, and discipline when listening to and exploring the patient's nursing history. You want to apply the relevant, to the, the relevant standards of practice when selecting your nursing measures. But again, use critical thinking attitudes such as fairness, confidence, and discipline. Please review the quick quiz, and if you have any questions, please contact your instructor. So the nursing process as it relates to bowel elimination. You want to apply the nursing process and use a critical thinking approach in the care of your patient. The nursing process provides a clinical decision making approach for you to develop and implement an individualized plan of care. So in all assessments you want to look through the patient's eyes. You take the nursing history. What a patient describes as their normal or abnormal is often different from factors and conditions that tend to promote normal elimination. Identifying normal and abnormal patterns habits and the patient's perception of normal and abnormal with, reg with regard to bowel elimination allows you to accurately determine if a patient is having problems. You want to organize their nursing history around that effect or the effect of elimination. You want to determine the usual elimination patterns, the patient's description of their stool characteristics, identification of routines followed to promote elimination, the presence and absence of bowel diversions, changes in appetite, diet history, des description of daily fluid intake, and these include the types and amounts of fluid in food, history of surgery or illnesses that affect the GI tract, an overall medical history, the patient or client's emotional state, history of exercise, history of whether there's been any pain or discomfort, social, social history, and manual dexterity. So again, you want to do a thorough assessment. You want to assess the consistency and the type of stools. And if you will take a look at the slide, you will see the different types, types one through seven of stool, in which we will review as well in the lab. When taking the physical assessment part of 
bowel elimination, you want to assess the mouth to the abdomen and the rectum. You want to conduct a physical assessment of body systems and functions likely to be influenced by the presence of elimination patterns. So again, inspect the teeth, tongue, rectum, and gums. You want to look and see, do they have poorly feeding dentures or are they missing teeth? You want to inspect all four quadrants of the stomach and also inspect the area around the anus for any lesions, discoloration, inflammation, and hemorrhoids. Lab test. There are no blood tests to specifically diagnose most GI disorders, but hemoglobin and hematocrit can be done to determine if anemia from GI bleeding is present. Other lab tests that may be ordered by the healthcare providers include liver function tests, serum amylase, and serum lipase, which are used to assess for hepatobiliary diseases and pancreatitis. And those are liver diseases. Diagnostic exams. The most common stool test is the fecal occult blood test. The most common stool test is the fecal occult blood test, which measures microscopic amounts of blood in the feces. It is a useful screening tool for colon cancer and it is recommended by the American Cancer Society. We will take a look at a fecal occult blood test in the lab. Radiological and diagnostic tests include direct and direct visualization as well as indirect vis visualization. The direct tests include endoscopy. Indirect visualization tests include anorectal manometry, x-rays with and without contrast medium, ultrasound, CTs, colonic transit studies, and MRIs. For patients experiencing alterations in the GI system, there are various radiological and diagnostic exams such as colonoscopy that require bowel prep for the test to be successfully completed. A bowel cleansing program may be difficult or unpleasant for the patient and the nurse needs to provide education and support to ensure an optimal test result. The second phase of the nursing process, diagnosis. Some diagnoses that apply to the patient with elimination problems include disturbed body image, bowel incontinence, constipation, perceived constipation, risk for constipation, diarrhea, nausea, and knowledge deficit in regards to nutrition. It is important to establish the correct related to factor for a diagnosis. This is going to be dependent upon the thoroughness of your assessment and the recognition and your recognition of defining characteristics and factors that impair elimination. Plan. When you're planning care, you want to synthesize information from multiple resources. You want to help the client to establish client-centered goals or patient-centered goals and outcomes. You incorporate the elimination habits and routines of the client. Reinforce the routines that promote health and consider pre-existing con concerns. You also, in the planning phase, want to set priorities because patients will have multiple diagnoses and, once again, know when to advocate for other members of the healthcare team to assess the patient. The nurse and the patient will work closely together to plan effective inter interventions. When the patient is disabled or de debilitated by illness, you may have to rely on the family to help build that plan of care. Other healthcare members such as dietitians and wound ostomy and continence nurses are also very valuable resources when bowel elimination is an issue. Again, we're implementing the care. Su successful nursing interventions improve the patient's and the family's understanding of bowel elimination. One of the most important habits to teach regarding bowel habits is, is to take time to defecate. Take time to defecate. You want to advise the patient to begin establishing a routine during a time when defecation is most likely to occur, usually an hour after a meal. When diagnosed early, colorectal cancer can be treated and eliminated, following the guidelines for prevention and knowing the early symptoms and seeking medical help if these symptoms occur in the most effective way to prevent disease. A number of interventions stimulate the defecation reflex, affect the character of feces, or increase peristalsis to help patients evacuate bowel contents normally and without discomfort. Any patient who has difficulty sitting because of muscular weakness and mobility concerns, elevate, 
elevated seats require patients to use less effort to sit or stand. Patients who are restricted to bed have to use bed pans for defecation, and you will see on the slide two types of bed pans that are available. The red, the regular, not red, the red, regular bed pan is made of plastic. It has a curved, smooth upper end and a sharper edged lower end. It is about two inches or five centimeters deep. The smaller bed pan, otherwise known as the fracture bed pan, is designed for patients with lower extremity fractures, has a shallow upper end with a 2.5 centimeter, one inch deeper end. The shallow end of the pan fits under the client's buttocks toward the rectum. The upper end, which has a handle that just goes under the thigh, upper thighs. The pan needs to be high enough so that the feces enters the pan. Take a look at the photo and you will see incorrect positioning of the bed pan on the top photo and correct positioning on the bottom. When positioning a patient, it is important to prevent muscle strain and any discomfort. Never lift a patient on a bed pan. Never pay, place a patient on a bed pan and then leave with the bed flat unless activity restrictions demand it. This forces the patient to hyperflex the back to lift the hips onto the pan. The proper position for the bed patient on a bed pan is with the head of the bed 30 to 45 degrees elevated. When patients are immobile or it is safe to allow them to raise their hips, it is safer for the caregiver and the patient to roll them onto the bed pan. Always, always, always wear gloves when handling bed pans because the single best way to prevent the spread of an infection is exactly. Health promotion. How to position the patient on a bed pan. Please pay particular attention to the orientation of the bed pan and how to place it on the patient correctly. We will go through the step-by-step -step process of applying bed pans in the lab. Chronically ill and hospitalized patients are not always able to maintain privacy during defecation. In a hospital or extended care setting, patients sometimes share bathroom facilities with a roommate. In addition, chronic illness may limit a patient's ability and activity tolerance and require the use of a bedpan or bedside commode. The sights, sounds, and odors associated with sharing toilet facilities or using bedpans are often very embarrassing. The embarrassment often causes patients to ignore the urge to defecate, which leads to constipation and further discomfort. Being sensitive to your patient's elimination needs and intervening to help them maintain a normal bowel elimination, as, as normal of a bowel elimination has, habits as possible. Laxatives and cathartics. Laxatives and cathartics. They have a short-term action of emptying the bowel. A cathartic has a stronger and more rapid effect on the intestines than laxatives. Suppositories may act more quickly than oral medications. And I would like to mention in this slide, antidiarrheal agents that contain opiates need to be utilized with caution. Enemas. An enema is the installation of a solution into the rectum and the sigmoid colon. The primary reason for an enema is to promote defecation by stimulating peristalsis. You will see listed here on the slides presentation the different types of enema. Cleansing enemas promote the complete evacuation of feces from the colon. They act by stimulating peristalsis through the infusion of a large volume of solution or through a small irritation of the mucosa of the lining. You can do a tap water, saline, normal saline, soap, soap suds solution, and low volume hypertonic, hyper, hypertonic saline solution. Each solution has a different osmotic effect, influencing the movement of fluids between the colon and the interstitial spaces beyond the intestinal wall. Infants and children will only receive normal saline laxatives because they are at greater risk for fluid imbalances. Remember that tap water is hypotonic and it exerts an osmotic pressure lower than fluid in, in the interstitial spaces. 
After infusion, infusion into the colon, tap water escapes from the abdominal lumen into the interstitial spaces. The net movement of water is slower, and the infused volume stimulates defecation before large amounts of water leave the bowel. Use caution if ordered to repeat tap water enemas because water toxicity or circulatory overload could develop. Normal saline is generally the safest solution to use because it exerts the same osmotic pressure as fluids in intestinal spaces surrounding the bowel. The volume of influ infused saline stimulates peristalsis. Hypertonic solution. Hypertonic solutions in food infused into the bowel exert osmotic pressure that pulls fluid out of the intestinal spaces. The colon fills with fluid and the resulting distension promotes defecation. Hypertonic, infused into the bowel and, the ex and it exerts osmotic pressure that pulls fluid out of the interstitial spaces. The colon fills with fluid and the resultant distension promotes defecation. People are often unable to tolerate large volumes of fluid and benefit most often from this type of enema, which is by design a low volume. Soap suds. If you add soap suds to water, a, or saline to create the effect of intestinal irritation to stimulate peristalsis. Use only pure Castile soap that comes in a liquid form that is included in most soap suds enema kits. Use soap suds enemas with, the, with caution in pregnant women and older adults because they could easily have electrolyte imbalances and damage the intestinal mucosa. The healthcare team provider sometimes orders a higher low cleansing enema. The terms high and low refer to the height from which and hence the pressure comes with when the fluid is delivered. High enemas will clean more of the colon. After the enema is infused, you want to ask the patient to turn from the left lateral side to the dorsal recumbent position over to the right lateral side. The position changes influences that the fluid reaches the large intestine. A low enzyme, enema cleanses only the rectum and sigmoid colon. Oil. The oil retention enema lubricate, lubricates the feces in the rectum and colon. The feces absorbs the oil and becomes softer and easier to pass. To enhance action of the oil, the patient retains the enema for several hours, if at all possible. Other types of enema include KX Select and Carminative. Carminative provides re relief from gaseous distension. It improves the ability to pass gas. Medicated enemas contain drugs. An example is sodium polystyrene sulfonate or KXLate. This is used to treat patients with dangerous dan used to treat patients with dangerously high serum potassium levels. This drug contains a resin that exchanges sodium for potassium in the large intestine. Another medicated enema is the neomycin solution, an antibiotic used to reduce bacteria in the colon before bowel surgery. In acute care, enemas are available in commercially packaged disposable units or with reusable equipment prepared before use. Sterile technique is not necessary because the colon normally contains bacteria. However, you want to wear gloves to prevent the transmission of fecal organisms because the single best way to prevent the spread of infection is hand hygiene. As with all procedures, you want to explain the procedure including the position, the precautions that will be avoided or taken to avoid discomfort and the length of time necessary to retain the solution before defecation. Giving an enema to a patient who is unable to contract the external sphincter poses difficulties. Giving the enema with the patient positioned on the bedpan and giving the enema with the patient sitting on the toilet are all unsafe ways because the position of the rectal tubing could injure the rectal wall. So no enemas if the patient cannot contract the external sphincter if they're not properly positioned in bed, and also do not give enemas when the person is on the toilet because of the position of the rectal tubing that could injure the rectal wall. For an impaction, the fecal mass is sometimes too large to pass voluntarily. If a digital rectal exam reveals a hard stool mass in the rectum, it may be necessary to manually remove it by breaking it up and bringing out a section at a time. Digital removal should be the last resort in the management of severe constipation, but it is often necessary if the fecal contents are too large to pass through the anal canal. This procedure is often very comfortable for the patient. 
please note that excess rectal manipulation stimulates irritation to the mucosa, bleeding, and also stimulation of the vagus nerve, which could result in a reflex slowing of heart rate. A patient's condition or situation sometimes requires special interventions to decompress the GI tract. Such conditions include surgery, obstruction of the GI tract often caused by tumors, trauma to the GI tract, and conditions which peristalsis is absent. A NG tube is a pliable hollow tube that is inserted through the patient's nasal pharynx into the stomach. There are two main categories of NG tubes, fine or small bore and large bore. Small bore tubes are frequently used for medication administration and enteral feedings. Large bore tubes, the 12 French and above, are usually needed for gastric decompression or removal of gastric secretions. NG tube insertion does not require sterile technique. Clean technique is used. The procedure is uncomfortable. The patient experiences a burning sensation as the tube passes through the sensitive nasal mucosa. When it reaches the back of the pharynx, the patient sometimes begins to get gag. You want to help the patient to relax to make the tube insertion easier. Some institutions will allow the use of xylocaine jelly or an anastomo. Excuse me. Some institutions will allow the use of xylocaine jelly or lidocaine when inserting the tube because it decreases patient discomfort during the process. After the tube is inserted, you want to make sure that you maintain tube patency. Sometimes the tip of the tube rests against the stomach wall or the tube becomes blocked with thick, thickened secretions. Flushing the tube regularly using a catheter tip syringe filled with normal saline or warm water helps to prevent blockage of the tube. If the NG tube does not drain properly after flushing, reposition it by advancing or withdrawing it slightly. Any change in tube position requires that you verify its placement in the patient's GI tract. Please take a moment to answer the quick quiz question. If you have any questions, please contact your instructor. Continuing and restoring care as it relates to bowel elimination. Regular bowel elimination patterns should begin before a patient goes home or to an extended care facility. It is important to remember that you initi initiate ostomy care and bowel training in acute care settings. However, because these are long-term needs, teaching is often continued in the restorative care or the home care setting. An individual with an ostomy will wear a pouch to collect the effluent or output from the stoma. The pouches are odor-proof and have a protective skin barrier surrounding the stoma. You want to empty the pouch when it is one-third to one-half full and changing the pouching system approximately every three to seven days depending upon the patient's individual needs. You want to assess the color. The color of the stoma should be pink or red. The color of a stoma should be pink or red. The skin should be observed at each pouch change for signs of irritation or skin breakdown. The skin protection is important because of the effluent because the effluent has digestive enzymes which may cause irritant dermatitis if there is leakage into the peristomal skin. Other peristomal skin problems are fungal rashes, folliculitis, or ulcerations, and they should be referred to the ostomy and wound nurse. Although the practice is not common due to improved odor proof pouches, some patients irrigate their sigmoid colostomies to regulate colon emptying. This process takes about an hour a day to complete, but usually means that the patient can wear only a mini pouch afterwards to absorb mucus from the stoma and contain gas. Any ostomy requires a pouch to collect the fecal material. An effective pouching system protects the skin, contains feces, remains odor-free, and is comfortable and inconspicuous. A person wearing a pouch needs to feel secure enough to participate in any activity, so you want to make sure you work on self-esteem. A pouching system consists of a pouch and a skin barrier. Pouch pouches often come in one and two piece systems and we will take a look at these and utilize them in the lab. After surgery, it may take a few days for patients with new ostomies to feel their appetite has returned to normal. Small servings of soft foods may be more appetizing as, as it would be for any patient who had an abdominal surgery. 
After ostomy surgery, patients face a wide variety of anxieties and concerns from learning how to manage their stoma to coping with conflicts of self-esteem, body image, and sexuality. Provide emotional support before and after surgery. Important factors affecting adjustment to the stoma include the ability to successfully assume care of the ostomy, including emptying the pouch and changing the pouching system so that unexpected odor and leakage of stool does not occur. Inability to resume self-care may cause a loss of self-esteem. The Wound Ostomy Incontinence Nurses Society provides information and helps patients locate wound ostomy incontinence nurses. Therefore, if you do not work in an area where you're always familiar with ostomies and you see a problem, you want to consider the local advocate that the patient see a wound ostomy incontinence nurse. And also, they can be referred to local ostomy groups that are affiliated with the United Ostomy Association of America. The patient with chronic constipation or fecal incontinence secondary to cognitive impairment may benefit from bowel retraining, also called habit training. The training program involves setting up a daily routine. By attempting to defecate at the same time each day and using measures that promote defecation, the patient may have a normal defecation pattern. In choosing a diet for promoting normal elimination, you want to consider the frequency of defecation, characteristics of the feces, and types of food that impair or promote defecation. A well-balanced diet with whole grains, legumes, fresh fruits and vegetables eaten regularly will promote normal elimination. Fiber adds bulk to the stool, eliminates excess fluids, and promotes more frequent and regular movements. With increasing fi fiber, it is important to drink enough fluids. When a patient has diarrhea, low-residue foods such as white rice, potatoes, Bread, bananas, and cooked cereals are recommended until the diarrhea is controlled. If the patient cannot tolerate foods or liquids orally, IV therapy with electrolyte replacement is going to be necessary. So, think about this. Why is it important to drink fluids when you're going to increase your fiber intake? Additionally, a regular exercise program also helps to prevent elimination problems. Walking, riding a stationary bike, or swimming stimulates peristalsis. It is recommended by the American Heart Association and the Centers for Disease Control that adults get at least 150 minutes of exercise per week. In the management of a patient with fecal incontinence or diarrhea, a fecal collector may be applied around the anal opening if the skin is intact. Fecal management systems are available for short-term use with high-volume diarrhea. The patient with diarrhea, fecal incontinence, or an ileostomy is at risk for skin breakdown when fecal contents remain on the skin. Liquid stool usually contains digestive enzymes that can cause rapid skin breakdown. Irritation from repeated wiping with toilet tissue or frequent ostomy pouch changes will further irritate the skin. Meticulous perianal skin care and frequent removal of fecal drainage is necessary to prevent skin breakdown. Cleansing with a no-rinse cleanser and application of a barrier ointment should be done after each episode of diarrhea. If the patient is incontinent, the patient must, have, must be checked frequently and have an immediate change of absorbent products in addition to thorough but gentle skin cleansing. Patients with ostomies may be unaware of the skin irritation under their wafer or think that this is a normal part of having ostomy. So as nurses, we need to educate them about skin breakdown and management or if it does occur, it is important that we advocate for them to be seen by the wound ostomy or, and or continence nurse. Evaluation. Again, you always want to see everything through the patient's eyes. And when we evaluate, we are evaluating whether the interventions help to meet the goals or the outcomes of the plan of care. The effectiveness of care depends on the success in meeting the expected outcomes of self-care. Optimally, the patient will be able to have regular pain-free defecations of soft form stools. The patient or caregiver is the only one who is able to determine if the bowel elimination problems have been relieved and which therapies were most effective. If the patient and nurse develop a therapeutic relationship, the patient will feel comfortable in discussing in intimate details when associated with bowel elimination. Patients are less embarrassed as nurses help them with elimination needs. Patients relate feelings of comfort and freedom from pain as elimination needs are met within the limits of their condition and treatment. 
You want to evaluate a patient's level of knowledge regarding establishing a normal elimination pattern, caring for an ostomy, and promoting skin integrity. Also determine the extent to which the patient accomplishes normal defecation. You want to ask the patient to describe any changes in diet, food intake, fluid intake, and activity to promote bowel health. Here are some questions that you may want to ask when the patient's expect when the patient's expected outcome has not been achieved. Do you use any medications such as laxatives or enemas to help you defecate? If so, how often? Are there any barriers preventing you from eating a high fiber diet or having a regular exercise program? How much fluid do you drink in a typical day and what kinds of fluid? Ensuring patient safety is an essential role of the professional nurse. To ensure patient safety, you want to communicate clearly with members of the healthcare team, assess and incorporate the patient's priorities of care and preferences, and use the best evidence when making decisions about your patient's care. When performing the skills in this chapter, you want to remember these following points to ensure safe, individualized patient care. Instruct patients who self administer enemas to use the side lying position. Tell them not to self administer an enema while sitting on the toilet because this position results in, rectal in the rectal tubing causing friction that could injure the rectal wall. Also, if a patient has cardiac disease or is taking hypertensive medications, obtain a pulse rate because manipulation of rectal tissues often stimulates the vagus nerve and can sometimes cause a sudden decline in pulse rate which increases the patient's risk of fainting while on the bed's pan, bedside commode, or the toilet. This concludes Skills Module 8. If you have any questions, please contact your instructor.